Good afternoon and welcome back from lunch. I am Megan Davies and I'll be the chair for today's session. I'm looking forward to two presentations today, both on English and multilingualism in the South African context. And first, I'd like to welcome up to the podium Zubeda Ndesai, who will be presenting to us on learning through the medium of English in multilingual South Africa, enabling disabling learners. Thank you, Madam Chi. Namaste, salam alaikum, good afternoon, everybody. I want to start off on a lighter note and tell you the story about my mother, who is now deceased. I was the first, two, two decades ago, I was the first one in my family to purchase an answering machine. And she used to phone me regularly to find out, to run errands for her. So I told her, when the answering machine comes on, she must tell the machine, Zubeda, I, I speak of a, a version of Marathi, Kokani. So I said to her, she must tell, tell the machine, Zubeda, gara elis mamana fonkar. So then for, for, for many weeks, she never used it at all. One day I came home from work late, and the message said, tell your mother phoned. <laughs> she, she couldn't believe that she could speak Kokani on the machine and that I would understand. So I said to her, it's not the machine that understands the Kokani, it's me that understands it. <laughs> The topic of my, of my paper is on the presentation is on the board, learning through the medium of English in multilingual South Africa, enabling or disabling learners, or another way of putting it is how can we enable all learners? Is it automatic that we will disable learners, or can we enable all learners by trying different strategies? That just gives you a brief overview of the talk. Now, I don't know whether many of you have heard that at the moment there are student protests, university student protests in South Africa, which have been going on for more than a, a month now. They st and in fact, before that, there were protests that had started at the University of Cape Town and at the University of Stellenbosch and the University of the Free State. At the University of Cape Town, the, the campaign was around the Roads Must Fall statue, and it was about the decolonizing the curriculum and, and what is taught at the University of Cape Town. And that went on for, for, for many weeks, and then it spread to other campuses, and that, at that stage, it spread to the former, what we used to call the former white campuses. At Stellenbosch, it took the form of an anti-Afrikaans approach. And the same thing happened at the University of the Free State. There was a clamor for getting rid of Afrikaans and using only English. Now, South Africa, is a deeply divided and unequal society, despite it being 20 years, 21 years, since the first democratic elections in 1994. It remains a deeply divided and unequal society. And recently, the students have been protesting about the fees. And they've won a victory in the sense that President Zuma has said that next year there will be no fee increases. But there are, there are groupings of students who are still continuing with the protests, and at the university where myself and Vio Kazi no normal work, the University of the Western Cape, it's actually closed at the moment because there are about 100 students that are still protesting and they're saying, do away with all fees. Cancel the historic debt, which is something like 250 million, which the university can't afford. And the university's approach is that we need to adopt a, a national strategy to deal with the issues, not an institutional strategy but the students aren't listening, and there's been a lot of vandalism at the university, and it's been quite an unsettling time for all of us in South Africa. So it's in that context that I think this conversation takes on a particular significance. And there's almost an Or Orwellian cry, English good, Afrikaans bad, African languages invisible. Now, I always say this, that during apartheid we had two official languages. Now we have 11. So a simple arithmetic tells me we should have a two plus approach. But in reality, what is happening, it's a two minus approach, with English being used predominantly in most domains of uh, higher domains in life, you see. Now, we, we, we've heard criticisms of this conference or previous conferences focusing only on the pedagogic, on, on the language and education. I'm not going to make any apologies for that. I am an educator, a teacher, 
And I'm adopting this, I'm approaching this topic from a pedagogic perspective, not from a political perspective. Then multilingual, in multilingual societies, people tend to use their linguistic repertoires as resources, not impediments. And I think educational institutions have to take this as their starting point, instead of ignoring pupils and students' existing language repertoires. We use that as a starting point, you see. And then I'm, I'm accepting that the clamor for English is a given. So the question is, how do we enable real access to English in vastly different contexts and vastly differing contexts? It's, it's almost a social justice issue. It would be hypocritical of me to deny people access to English. And so the question is, how do we enable access, real access, for the majority of people in South Africa? And increasingly, I'm realizing that the one-size-fits-all approach does not work in the South African context and probably in many other multilingual contexts. That we need to look very sensitively at the differing contexts and adopt different strategies for different situations. But having said that, I think we need to realize that in South Africa under apartheid, difference meant historically inequality. So any kind of difference is treated with suspicion. So one has to be very sensitive as to how one approaches the different strategies. And the three contexts that I will be looking at are a township school, Crystal House South Africa, now, I believe there's a crystal house in India as well, and I'll talk about it when I, when, I, when I come to that point, and then what I call former white schools, and then I'll make some concluding remarks. Now, English is learnt and used as a medium in very many different contexts. There are those who are learning English voluntarily to expand their linguistic repertoires, but there are those that are forced to learn English to enable them to gain access to education and to other domains in life. And that's, that's my focus, the focus of my paper. And in that category are people that are immersed in English and people that are uh, uh, learning English in a school context. So people that are acquiring English, for example, in a country like the United States or United Kingdom would be immersed in English. But likewise in South Africa, people who live in, in, in the former white suburbs would be immersed in English, unlike people who are living in a township area, like Kailicha. Now, I want to just try and give you the brief features of the different kinds of scenarios that I'll be looking at. And the, I'm capturing them quite simplistically. Obviously, it's much more complex than this, but for the purposes of the presentation, I'm just mentioning the essential points. Now, in, in, a, in, a, in a township school in Kailicha, the, the population, believe it or not, even though it's in a city area, it's a, Kailicha is a peri-urban area, it's a relatively homogeneous linguistic environment, where almost 99% of the, of, the, of the population would speak Kosa, is it Kosa, and some of them would hardly have any access to English. There is very little exposure to English at home, despite, despite television, there's very little exposure to English at home, and there aren't many books available in English for these for pupils in this, this area. And then teachers are not always proficient in English. And then English is learnt as what is known in South Africa as a first additional language, what some people would refer to as a second language. It's not learnt as a home language, despite the fact that it is used as a medium of instruction from grade four. So when they come to grade four, they are expected to behave as mother tongue speakers of English and, 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 and learn all the subjects in English, but they ac actually have never learned English as a home language. They've only learned it as a second language. And there's a disjuncture between the requirements of English as a medium and the syllabus for English first additional language. English first additional language is fairly easy compared to the requirements of the curriculum. Now, Crystal House South Africa is a school that was started by Crystal Dahan. And she's got four other such schools, one in India, one in Mexico, one in the United States, and I can't remember where the fifth one is. And these are schools that are very well resourced, but they cater for the children of the poor. And in, in the South African context, there's one in Cape Town, and it caters largely for children who are, were formerly classified colored 
or African language speaking children. And the teachers are all proficient in English. And where the children are speakers of Isin Kosa, in those classes, there's a teacher aide who speaks Isin Kosa. It's a resource rich environment and it offers English as a home language. So that's the context of. Sorry, the other thing I wanted to say is that the children of Crystal House don't, aren't really exposed much to English at home. But the, the school environment, they get very good exposure to English. Unlike the township children who aren't exposed to English at, at home, nor in the school properly. You see? That's the difference. And then you get the former white schools, where the classrooms are often linguistically diverse in that the pupil population speaks different languages. But the teachers are usually from an English language background and usually speakers of English as a home language. The pupils generally come from more middle class environments and there is English often spoken at home. And then the pupils come from areas which are fairly linguistically diverse. So they won't come from a, only an Isikosa speaking environment. They would come from an area where maybe Afrikaans is spoken or English is spoken, depending on where they live. Sorry. Uh, I think it was Harun yesterday that mentioned the annual national assessments that the country undergoes every year and they are in, in numeracy and literacy or English and for home language, I mean home language and, and mathematics. And I just wanted to give to you the 2014 annual results for home language at grade 3, 6 and 9 levels. So grade 6 and 9 they would be studying through the medium of English but these are still, they have been tested in their home language. And at grade three, home language was 56% uh, score in, in grade six, average score. Grade six, it was 63%. And in grade nine, it was 48%. Now, bear in mind that at least 70%, if not no, more, about 80% of the pupils in South Africa have African languages as home languages. So when I say home language, it means all the 11 languages, but the majority of them are African languages. And in fact, you'd see that there was a decline in grade nine. It was 48%. What happens is that the, as for the first three years, the home language is used both as a medium and as a subject. And in grade six, six, it's still fairly fresh. But in grade nine, it's quite a few years since they've really studied the language. And so they, they, they scores decline in that language. And, they, and they're not really any better for English as a first additional language because the first additional language scores were for grades four, six, and nine. 41% averages, 45%, and in grade 9, 34%. So you see in grade 9 a decline in both their home language and a decline in their first additional language. So if I were to sum up the access to English in those three different contexts, in the township school, it would be access to English would be limited and it would be flawed. And in the Crystal House school, there would be very good exposure, but it would be confined to the school environment. And in the, models, the former Model C schools or the former white schools, there'd be very good exposure, which is not only confined to the school environment, they're also getting good exposure in the home, in the home background, in the home environment. Now, before I, I, I produce a, a move to the next slide, I just wanted to illustrate to you, I did a task with grade four pupils in a township school. It was a narrative piece of writing. I gave them uh, six pictures in, and they had to put them in sequence and then they had to write a, sto a narrative story in, based on those pictures. And I gave them the same task in, gray, in, in English and in Kosa. So this is what the child, a, a pupil in grade four wrote in Isi Kosa. And I will give the English translation of that in a short while, but you see that is what the, the pupil wrote. Quite a bit of text. And that would be the English translation of that is in closer version. And I'll just give you a moment to look at that.
And then that same child wrote this in English about that same picture story. That is what the child did in his own language, her own language, and this is what the child does in English. And in grade four, we judge them on the basis of this. I've got five minutes, I've got to rush off. Uh, so, so my argument is that in, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really concerned about the former white schools, they can look after themselves, they got their resource rich. I'm not really worried about the Crystal House School, it can also look after itself. My concern is more with the township schools and how we enable access to English in, in, the, in the kind of context that I illustrated now. And here I think it is crucial that we look at the link between the home language or the mother tongue and English. That, I mean, if this is what a child can do in his own language, then this is, this is what you need to draw on instead of pretending it doesn't exist and pretend that this is all that the child knows, you see. So there needs to be a much closer relationship between home language development and the acquisition of English in that kind of context. And this is something that is supported by the Canadian scholar Jim Cummins, who writes, who's written a lot about the relationship between first language development and acquisition of a second language. And the kinds of bilingual programs at work that are successful are those that draw on the home language. And then in that kind of context, I would argue that English needs to be taught as a subject but it needs to be taught by people who are proficient in the language and who are specialists in English language teaching. Currently what happens is that uh, in primary school, the teacher teaches virtually all the subjects, virtually all, regardless of whether the teacher is strong in English or not. And I, I have said this elsewhere and I've even said this to government officials, is that maybe we need to think, if we say there aren't enough English teachers, maybe we need to think in terms of itinerant teachers. So a particular district, there will be English specialists, and they would move from one school to the other instead of having people who aren't proficient in English teaching English as a subject because then they don't acquire English sufficiently to be able to use it later in life. And this is a view that is borne by many studies which focus on both L1 and L2 development. Ramirez's study in the United States in 1991, Thomas and Collier's study in 2002, my own studies in, in, in Kailicha, the Loitasa project as well, these all, these all illustrated there's an uh, important link between the first language development and uh, acquiring a second language. And, and this applies particularly to the written languages, the, the written standard of, of the language. And, uh, I, I enjoyed Osama's energizing talk, but I think that the written medium is the business of education. We cannot ignore that. And when, when, when children go to school, they have to acquire the written medium. Regardless of what we might think about democracy, etc., the elitists, we have to acquire the written medium. And this is a view that's also borne by Kwesi Kwapra, the sociologist and language scholar from Ghana, who is based in Cape Town. And he says that this richness in command over languages is, however, mainly oral, with little or hardly any basis in literacy. And he says, it is a multilingualism which suffers from all the debilities of orality as opposed to lit literacy. I know it's not something that Osama will agree with, but I, I, I think that in, in education, this is a very important aspect, that we need more opportunities for children to write in their own languages. And this, this, the, the child that, that wrote, produced that piece, they didn't have opportunities to, to write like that. There, there are very few opportunities to write at school. It's also a point that's taken up by Hassan Alidu, the importance of developing written materials in African languages if we want to keep them alive and, and intellectualize them, as John said earlier, drawing on, on Neville and Bamboche. Now, the, one of the concluding slides that I want to show is that when we talk about the medium of instruction, we tend to see it as an either, it's an all or nothing approach. But I think we need to see it much more flexibility. It refers to the languages used for teaching, the languages used in the setting of assignments and tasks and exams, the languages used in, in writing the exams and the tasks, the languages used in the text material that's available, and the languages that students use in their own self-directed learning. I'll skip that one. I'll just conclude by saying that I want to draw on Wolf's quote 
Language is not everything in education, but without language, everything is nothing in education. And in terms of township schools, people would say, yes, but there are lots of mixed schools nowadays. But the integration that's happening in South Africa is a one-way integration at the top level. It's not happening at the bottom level. The township schools remain largely 99% African. The, the teachers are mainly African, African language speaking. But it's the white schools that are becoming integrated, you see. And so I conclude, by, that's the picture story that I gave them. And just to say that, I want to conclude by saying, reiterating the point that I started off, that in access to English can be enabling for all students if we adopt different approaches for different contexts. Thank you very much. Sorry for rushing like that. Thank you, Zoveda, for that great presentation. I'd like to allow some time for questions. I have about 10 minutes. Any questions that anyone might have? I do have a microphone. Do you mind if I sit down? Yeah, that's mind? okay. Yeah. Do we have another microphone for some questions? Can you please introduce yourself? Thank you. Um, John Simpson, um, British Council, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, more of a comment, really, than a question simply to, to reinforce um, one of the points that um, Zubeda was making, except in this occasion it's not so much to do with the um, students' language, but, but, but um, t t teachers. And it somehow bears out the um, very striking contrast you were showing between the pupils' um, two versions of it text, you know, the same, that's right, one in, 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 in the African language and, and the paucity of, of the text in English. And I was just thinking of how that's also paralleled in um, some work which was done by the EDQUAL uh, consortium uh, in, in fact, um, Ghana and, and Tanzania, um, looking at um, comparing the language of instruction in, in, in Kiswahili in, in Tanzania with um, English media of instruction at the same level uh, of basic education. And, and essentially a similar finding um, came from that work, which was that um, teachers had a much richer uh, repertoire of teaching styles and strategies when they were working through the, the familiar language, Kiswahili in Tanzania or one of the um, Ghanaian languages in Ghana, compared with the, um, the, the, the more limited um, professional skills repertoire of teachers who were working through the medium of English. And in most cases, of course, for them, it, it was an additional language. So it actually works on both ways, uh, limiting the um, teachers' um, repertoire of professional skills as well as the, the learners' you know, demonstration of, of their knowledge and their ability. So. Hi, thank you, Zubeda, for that really interesting talk. I love the slide on what the medium of instruction means. You have a list. Could you show that again, possibly? Uh, do we have time? The, the, yes, the one about um, when the medium, what the medium of instruction means for teaching, materials, assessment, and there were a few others, and I thought that was really interesting. But also a really nice point about what students can do in there each of their languages. There we are. There. Yeah, thank you. Is there anything else you want to say about that? I don't know. I just think that's really interesting. It's a, it's, it's a good reminder of what all of the things that go into a medium of instruction decision. So thank you for that. Just to kind of comment on that, yeah, uh, at, the, at the University of the Western Cape, when I was teaching a module on social linguistics and education, I used to translate the question paper into English, Afrikaans, and Kosa. But the students would all write in English, but it's amazing how many of them came to me to say, thank you for having translated the questions. At least we could understand the questions. So even if it's a small step, but it's, it's how appreciative students get when one makes the attempt to try and meet them halfway. So it's not an all or nothing approach. There are lots of things that we can do that we're not doing.
Uh, thanks very much, Zubaida. I just want to pick up on, on, on your last point about what we can be doing. And I would like to ask you what you think universities could be doing in terms of preparing teachers uh, to teach uh, particularly uh, early grade literacy to actually help them to teach more effectively? I think universities can do much more than they are. And for example, for the next year we are offering a new program, the Foundation Phase, Bachelor of Education in the Foundation Phase of Teaching. And we want to uh, try out a, a, a dual medium approach in, in, in our classrooms, in our lecture theatres, so that we model for them what we expect them to model in the classroom. But, and, and, and at the same time also producing some materials in, Af in Kosa and Afrikaans instead of only in English. And also getting students, uh, get to, 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 to developing concepts in, in other languages other than only English, you see. So that's what we want to do. We have been doing it in, in very small ways. And one of the things that I argue is that what often happens is that it's left to the individual, the, good, good, the goodwill of the individual academic. It must be an institutional response and a national response rather than the goodwill of one or other academic. At the moment, it depends on our goodwill. Yeah, go ahead. If I could just very quickly um, um, pick up on Carol's observation of this and, and add to the, it's a whole area really of um, assessing learning and the languages which are used, because this is absolutely critical to learning outcomes uh, and, and achievement. And it seems to me that whereas some research, some interesting work has been done in the area of the curriculum, um, textbooks, pedagogy, etc., cetera, um, relatively little, I think, uh, focus has been on uh, issues around assessing learning in, for example, English as an additional language, as distinct from um, you know, um, familiar languages and the, the impact of that on, um, you know, um, um, students' learning outcomes. I know, I know of one study in, in Zanzibar, um, the SPINE project, um, Student Performance and National Examinations, which was, I think, led by P Pauline Ray Dickens of um, Bristol University. And what they very ably demonstrated was just how much, you know, um, <coughs> the usage of English as an additional language in national examinations uh, limited uh, students' ability to demonstrate uh, their knowledge and skills and so it was actually de depressing their um, examination scores and so, you know, it, it for me is a critical area uh, of research and for us to engage with and I, I, I'd like to see more of that happening really. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very important point. And there is very little work happening in that regard. It's something that we tried out in the Loitasa project, the language of instruction in Tanzania and South Africa, where we looked at, in South Africa, we looked at mathematics and science, where learners from grade four to six were taught the, in the experimental class, they were taught in Isi Kosa, and in the, uh, the other class, control class, they were taught in English. But even in the experimental class, we gave them the materials in English and in Kosa. We had translated workbooks into Kosa, and then the assessment was entirely in Kosa for maths and science. And some of those learners did far better, many, many of them did far better than the girls, than the students in the control class. And some of them actually even landed up at the University of the Western Cape and started doing, doing, doing degrees. And in fact, we, they come and say hello to us after so many years. So that, that's an area that I think needs to be further researched because are we really assessing pupils and students' knowledge if they are writing in a language that they can't express themselves in, but they know the answers? And how do we know they know the answers if we don't assess them in their language? Mm. All right, unless there are any other brief questions, I think we're going to move on. Thank you so much, Sabeda, for your presentation and for the questions and comments. Now, our next presentation that we'll have will be strengthening the Im implementation of multilingualism empowering or marginalizing South African learners. And this will be presented by Harun Mohammed, who's the Director of Continuing Teacher Professional Development, and by Caroline Grant, who's the Head of English for Education Systems in the British Council. So welcome to the podium.
So good afternoon, namaste, salam alaikum, and um, all the other languages that may be represented and I'm not aware of. And as indicated, it's a joint presentation, so I'll do the beginning part. Caroline will come in and then I'll end up with uh, a few concluding points. Um, the presentation outline is, uh, we'll do a little bit of con contextualization, but I think Zubaydah's presentation has given you a, s a clear sense um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on the slides that I had prepared. In fact, I think it might be more fruitful to talk about the how issues, and I've got a couple of discussion points to put forward. But just to indicate that um, briefly, I'll just share not the aim so much, but the experience that we've had in the implementation of multilingualism, and then the responses to those experiences in the last few years. Uh, and Caroline will speak particularly about the English First Edition language and a little bit about the collaboration that the department has with British Council, um, even in the um, incremental introduction of African languages. But maybe just to preemptively, you can see our response is English first additional language, incremental introduction of African languages, sign language, which hasn't been spoken much about in this conference, and then English across the curriculum, which was mentioned by Ajit Mohanty in his speech as well, and a couple of concluding points. So just very generally, South Africa has policies and programs supportive and committed to multilingualism. If you look at our constitution and you look at our language and education policy and recently the um, incremental um, introduction to policy, the commitment um, is there and there are programs that are meant to be su supported. From the information that I have available, significant strides have been made to valorize the historically marginalized languages. Um, there is implementation, but the implementation is experiencing delays depending on where you're coming from. But a lot of the people I speak to, and I, one of the projects in my directorate is about the implementation of African languages. And, and so um, th there's a sense of frustration that after 20 years, we've moved so slowly. Uh, and my sense is most people would agree with that. And resource constraints, which I'll speak a little bit about just now. So after 21 years of democracy, and in spite of constitutional and policy commitments, the current profile of the provision of multilingualism is still unlevel. And my concluding point is that although we've made progress and there's reason to celebrate, a lot more is needed to, to uh, reach equity and a couple of points will be made around that. So I'm gonna skip all of this because I did present this yesterday and when the paper comes out, we'll put all of that um, um, in the presentation. But the pattern is, you know, the, the um, former colonized languages, particularly English and Afrikaans, are very strong in official and trades, and uh, in, in the trade spheres, but in terms of usage, um, the African languages are most predominant, and as somebody was presenting, um, almost every South African, every South African can speak three languages, at least. Okay, Zubeda mentioned something about the ANA results, so we had some graphic illustration of the point you were making. Maybe the most important point to make is that most learners in South Africa learn in a language that is not their home language. And because the inequality profile is so stark, the majority of them don't have the materials that your and my children probably have had in the home to enable them to learn English. So, you know, there's a double disadvantage there. Uh, but let me move on. I'm going to skip all of these. This is the LEAP policy. As I'm saying, the commitment is there. In practice, what is happening is children, most, in most schools, children spend three years, uh, their first three years in home language instruction. But just an important caveat is that most of the teachers teaching in those languages are not well qualified. And that's because of the deliberate uh, uh, policy of the past where African languages were provided as subjects, but provision for um, uh, teaching in African languages um, uh, is not strong. So I'm going to skip all of this. Uh, I want to move rather to the experience. So DEEP has been in implementation since 1994. There is substantial support for it by all sections of the diverse society. It's an important point to make because it was a huge battle to get that sense of consensus. And even now, um, there are some sections of the South African population who resist or, you know, they, they, for purposes of um, national contribution or patriotism, they support it, but they don't support it with their heart. So the example in Luvuyo's presentation that was made earlier on for me is a form of illustration um, um, of that. 
Okay, and it has not been possible to offer the full provision to the policy due to logistical and financial challenges, but my thinking is there's, the policy needs some revision, I'll make a comment about that uh, just now. So the general, the data that we have is showing us there's not enough qualified teachers and materials to offer teaching off and in the indigenous languages. And as Luvuyo's presentation indicated, and as I mentioned yesterday, in the introduction of the incremental um, uh, introduction of African languages, what we found is we were supposed to implement national policy in 2014, but it was delayed because we were not able to find enough teachers to, to teach it in a small portion, and it's about 6% of our schools. Um, okay, so there, there have been pilot projects wherein children are taught in the home language. The results have been very positive. The I just mentioned that earlier on, but in one of the rural areas in the Eastern Cape, a school has been implementing um, uh, in the first in the, in the primary school instruction in Isikosa, and they, the comparison is showing that the children are performing better than the children who are in uh, English medium. So, yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to skip that. Okay. I think we've made, made that point, so I'm not going to... Okay, so just the language development framework. So English first additional language was introduced as a compulsory uh, teaching offering in the foundation phase since 2012, I think it was, and that wasn't the case before. But that was out of a recognition of the current minister who felt, you know, having looked at the uh, annual national assessment and the school exit exam results, where you could see that the children were struggling with English as the medium of assessment. So that's been introduced, and Caroline will speak a little bit more about the project that we've got to try and um, improve the teaching of English first additional language. I'll say a little bit about the incremental introduction of African languages, uh, sign language, and English across the curriculum. Uh, so just some information about the, the progress uh, that's been made. Um, we're hoping the program next year will be successful. There's still a bit of a struggle at the moment around um, finding the teachers, finding the budget for the teachers in those schools that are not offering um, um, African language at the moment. And we've asked our provinces to develop what we're calling a customized profile of every teacher who will be teaching so that the teacher support and development program that they um, will have to undergo is suited to their needs. So it, the point I'm making is that in the last five or six years, the attempt has been made, but it hasn't been very successful because the pitch, the, 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 the alignment between the competence that they have and the support that they need, we didn't get right. Okay, so I'm going to skip through all of this. And just before Caroline comes in, I, I thought I'd just make a couple of points because I've sacrificed my, some of my slides. One of the issues in this conference that has been coming up is, are people aware of multilingualism and multilingual policy? In South Africa, there is awareness, but my sense is it's first level awareness. And to be able to implement the policy effectively, you need textured and in-depth awareness. So our sense of the work moving forward is that more work needs to be done in making people aware of the depth that's required to be able to offer uh, uh, multilingual uh, experiences. Then at the policy level, what was very interesting in one of the presentations yesterday is um, that you need at least six years of instruction in home language before you make a transition to, if you want to call it English in, in the South African case, and South Africa is not doing that. So my sense is that there should be, even though I'm a government, government official and I'm a policy maker and I support the policy that there is, but I think there needs to be policy review um, around that and I'm certainly going to be lobbying quite strongly for, for six years. Um, um. Okay, the other issue is um, the, um, the valorization of African languages needs a lot more attention than it has been the case. Uh, um, nobody's mentioned it so far, but in the South African case, what has happened is since 1994, when the languages were given their, their, their rights and their place, there hasn't been consensus among the language people around what constitutes standard Isizulu or Isikosa. And, and that fight still continues. So it's a standardization and valorization issue. Um, then the issue of resources, you need more time to be able to offer a multilingual uh, uh, experiences. And in the case of English first additional language, what we're finding is both with the teachers and learners, if you don't have enough time, you don't get the depth. Um, and then issues around uh, content and methodology, um, and then teacher training. But I'll, I've got a little bit more time, so I'll, um, I'll say.
Okay, um, I'd like to pick up on the uh, uh, British Council collaboration with the Department of Basic Education and uh, more recently with the Department of Higher Education and Training as well. Uh, this collaboration started in uh, 2012 and I think what was absolutely critical for us as the British Council was to um, really fit in with the department's policy and with the language policy and to spend actually quite a long time, at least six months um, of consultation with the DBE and other key stakeholders, including teacher unions in South Africa, to ensure that whatever we were doing was supporting the policy and that it was not regarded as a small project or in South African uh, terminology, an add-on. I heard this term repeatedly uh, from people in the department where they would reassure teachers what we're doing with the British Council is not an add-on because otherwise it would not have been accepted. You know, uh, South African uh, teachers have been really overburdened with many, many policy changes, curriculum changes, and uh, this was not the time now to bring in something that was going to be seen as an add-on. Anyway, to move on to what, what is it exactly? Well, it's rooted within a very high-level uh, memorandum of understanding or declaration of intent, uh, signed up at a very high level with the Minister of Education uh, in South Africa um, and the CEO of the British Council. So, and it's a long-term collaboration. It's a seven-year uh, collaboration. And it clearly sets out the roles and responsibilities of each of the partners and it's clearly understood and shared what these are. Practically, what does that mean? Um, it was identified that teacher training was absolutely critical, and so the core of our program is around um, teacher training, the uh, certificates in primary and secondary English language teaching, which I will refer to as SIPELT and SISELT, and these are British Council-developed teacher training programs that have been developed from our experience of teaching um, English second language across the world and a very practical yet rich um, teacher training offer which I will go into in more detail. The strengthening of English medium instruction. Um, I'll touch on how the work we've been doing with the teacher training in Seipelt and Seisalt has also had a very positive um, effect on uh, the incremental introduction of African languages. Uh, we are piloting a Learn English Audio project, which I'll speak briefly about, and then there's some, some other offers uh, in, in science, uh, maths, and school leadership. Um, I'm just going to move on a bit. I think the last point is really key. Um, and I think it points to the sustainability of the program, is that we provide the technical support and perhaps some innovation, but the department provides the institutional support, the policy direction, and the resources for the rollout of the program. And I think this is absolutely critical for the success of such a collaboration. Once the um, DOI has expired, the program is there, it's embedded. Okay, so um, why are we focusing on English? Well, because it's in the policy. It's key to the policy that English first additional language has been prioritized. Moving on to these courses and the aims of these courses, very ambitious aims to reach 400,000 teachers and 12 million learners in South Africa. Um, I spoke about the expanding the knowledge of, you know, good sound practices and in, in English, uh, a focus on key themes and topics, um, and also critically to, to develop the reflection and action planning skills of the teachers. These are how the courses have been uh, designed and developed. So that's the, the kind of the, the underlying principle uh, of, of the course, both courses. Uh, I'm moving on to the SIPELT. It's a modular course with a strong focus on resource development, 
uh, teachers making their own resources out of locally available materials and then trying out those resources. The SciSelf, the secondary course, has two levels to it, uh, with a strong focus on um, encouraging learner independence and also tapping into different learning styles. Um, this is just an, a, a, an overview of the kinds of modules within that course. Uh, what we also did with both courses was we uh, ensured that we also wrote additional courses uh, together with, with the DBE to fill in any gaps. So we map, mapped the courses against the curriculum and then filled in any gaps with new material. Uh, an unintended consequence for the British Council, certainly, was that these courses, the methodology offered in these courses, actually had a big impact on the, the new policy for um, introducing African languages. And you'll see that these are the key transferable aspects of SIPELT. Um, and the course writers within the DBE uh, essentially took the methodology for English first additional language, and I said, this is going to work perfectly well for the African languages. And I'd just like to show you a very short, oops, Haroon, can you? Just get, get the video going. Uh, while Haroon's getting that going. No, oh, no, it's not going to. Hopefully. I just wanted to show you a very short clip um, of the SIPELT course in action, uh, just to give you a, a flavor. And I'm going to show you how to play this game. A, you throw the dice. After throwing the dice, you read what is on the face of the dice, and you do the action. And then before you ask, what did you do? and then you respond. Let's try it. Throw the dice, Munipi. Let's try it once more. You must speak louder. Breathe louder. Throw the dice. Eat. I'm going to show you how to play this game. A, you throw the dice. After throwing your dice, what is on the face of the dice and you do the action and then okay <laughs> okay right. okay right so that was just a, just a, a very short clip and then the third intervention was to focus on the multi-grade schools in South Africa, of which there are 6,000, uh, where resources are extremely limited, including uh, lack of el electricity. So we've been trialing these um, uh, solar-powered MP3 players with SD, S, uh, SD cards that are actually preloaded with curriculum-related re uh, material. Uh, so I'd like to hand over to Haroon now. Okay, we've already spoken about this. I'm going to skip past it, you know, just to uh, reiterate that from next year, all schools that are not offering African languages, so that will be mainly the formerly white Indian and colored schools. Um, and, but there are some, some schools in the African component who don't offer Okay, so I'm going to skip all of that, but let's move to the conclusion. So um, the current um, multilingual policy in South Africa, we convinced, raises the profile of all the languages, is intended to make a contribution to redressing the imbalance of uh, English and Afrikaans as the dominant languages, and will contribute to, to social uh, cohesion. It will take English and Afrikaans mother tongue speakers out of their comfort zone and provide opportunity with for empathy with the majority of learners. In fact, there are some schools, particularly in the Western Cape, where the schools have enthusiastically taken this on, and the evidence that we've been getting back is showing that, you know, that that's been the case. Uh, proficiency in three South African languages equips all learners with soft skills and intercultural tools to succeed in the workplace. 
it will contribute to the transformation of schools and universities. In fact, one of the universities, the University of KwaZulu-Natal, is already embarking on a program of um, making sure that offering is in, in African languages. This against the background that a few years ago, a lot of the African language faculties were closing down. And then there was a sudden return of energy and um, that's been turned around. And then so we're saying, unless there is sufficient investment and deep investment in teacher training, teaching and learning materials, and transformative language policies at basic and higher education levels, it may not progress beyond a superficial attempt to redress language and uh, inequity. And if I could just maybe make one or two points that I wasn't able to make when I was on earlier. Um, the issue of the content of English, I think, is an important issue. Um, I think, as Ajit was saying in his opening presentation, English is not a neutral language. But there are forms, and more work needs to be done on presentation of forms of the language which is friendly to people who are coming into the language from, from a home language background. But the content includes issues around decolonization of the language and the culture of English, and obviously Afrikaans yeah, in our case. And that will probably make a big difference as we, as we move forward. But thank you very much. All right, thank you so much to both Haroon and Caroline. Now we have questions for either of the presenters. Yes. Yeah, let's get a microphone. Sorry. <laughs> yes, to Carol first. Hi, thank you so much for that. It was a lot of information at once, <laughs> and I would love to go back to us a slide if possible and it was the key transferable aspects so the things that you feel have transferred from this English uh, focus to improving the situation of African languages I didn't quite get that and there were a lot of things on that chart that I'm not that sure one. yeah could you possibly explain it a little okay. more um so if we start with, okay, the emphasis on learning styles. Um, so, so, so within the, within the course, uh, the SIPELT course, the Certificate in Primary English Language Teaching, there's a strong emphasis on uh, providing opportunities and tasks that, that, key, uh, that key into different learning styles. Um, so, uh, there are also uh, activities and strategies to, to focus strongly on developing listening and speaking, which tends to be neglected. Um, so uh, total physical response so, uh, is also a very key part, particularly in, the, in, in grade one, grade one, grades one to three, using, uh, using that as an effective technique for teaching and learning. Um, using translation and opportunities to use the home language uh, for instructions and seeing the home language as a, a, a rich resource to enable the learning of English. Uh, lots of opportunity to use songs and rhymes and uh, the resources actually given uh, to the teachers. Um, Again, there's a whole uh, uh, module on vocabulary and how you make it me memorable. And in each, each of the modules, there's a lesson plan and a set of resources uh, to help the teacher. So it's not just a theoretical course. Um, and again, for, for each one of those, um, there's a whole module uh, around each of those topics a lesson plan and additional resources and during the training the teachers are shown how to make the resources and how to use them. So I don't know if I've made that clear. I mean, it, it transfers to the teaching of African languages as additional languages or because if you're, if you're working with a language that children already speak, you don't need to use TPR, for example. So I'm, I, that's why I'm not clear about this slide in particular. Yeah. So uh, um, one thing I think you're, you're 
I get is that some, there's some good teaching methodologies that are definitely crossing over. Mm. But I'm talking about the, uh, okay, go on. You know, I was just going to say, what had happened was when we did the side belt and side salt with our subject advisors, because of the communicative approach that was used, it was at that time, that was between 2012 and early 2015, regarded as one of the best training sessions that the National Department had coordinated. Um, so, so what then happened was we took, if you want, the methodology of the, the, the side belt and side salt and developed materials and ran training programs and we did the training for the African language incremental introduction. So, so yeah, I, th I think in a nutshell, the point is that it's very interactive, it's communicative, it's a focus on creativity that, that is the strength of this process. So, oh, sorry, so you mean the actual training strategies yes. transferred? Okay, thanks. And I think also the course design as well. Okay, I think next is Zubeda and then to the back. Just a quick question, and I'm not trying to put you under the spotlight, spotlight, but it's something that I commented on when the incremental introduction of African languages was being introduced, as the, our faculty had to respond, and it, 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 it was part of my faculty's response. My concern was that it might be more wise to introduce the, 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 the other African language in grade four rather than in grade one, given that our students, our pupils are struggling with, with literacy in their home language, let alone literacy with English, and, and to now introduce him to another African language in grade one within in a very short school day makes it very difficult to, to do things properly. So in fact, my suggestion was, I, I, I applauded the, the, the initiative, but introduce it later in grade four. I don't know how far gone this is, whether it will happen in grade one, or, or whether there's still opportunity to, to assess that. Okay, the, the, major, the first point maybe to make is the majority of the learners who will be exposed to IOL will be non-African language users. Sorry, but I thought if I'm speaking Isi Zulu, then I will learn Isi Sepedi. No, 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 no. 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 This, this is in schools that are not offering Africa, any African language at all. Okay, but I, I thought the, the, the policy was in, in indicating no. that we want a Sepedi speaker to learn Zulu and vice versa. No, no, And no. English-speaking people and Afrikaans-speaking people to learn an African language. No, this, is, this was mainly, I mean, it's applying to English and Afrikaans okay. users of the language, yeah. So it's a, in that sense, it's a small... Yes, you didn't say that initially. Yeah, there was a revision of the policy, and as I said, you know, there, there were, in, over the three-year period, there was a lot of pushing and pulling and delays because there was a level of unreadiness, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. Thank you. There's one question in the back. It's probably all we'll have time for. Thank you, Caroline and Harun. I've got a question, Caroline, with regard to training, uh, your, your training, professional development training. Eh? I think I heard you saying that uh, one of your slides, in fact, so you, you, if we were saying that you're focusing on pre-service and in-service trainers, I mean teach, teachers, if I'm correct. Yeah. And then I was just, just interested to check with you as to how do you do it with pre-service uh, uh, teachers? How, how, how do you do that kind of training? Uh, as a, uh, my understanding would be that those would still be students in, in, in institutions of higher education. And uh, the, second, the second question I have is for, for Harun with regard to the implementation of IOL. Uh, 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 with regard to the, the training of, of teachers, who are the teachers who, who will be teaching, uh, uh, who will be implementing this program? The reason why I'm asking uh, that question is that uh, um, I'm, I'm a bit concerned if, uh, for example, we don't really give a, a rigorous training in African languages. We base whatever we're doing on the basis of English. Because I think each a, a, a language should be dealt with deeply within its own structure and within its all other things that a, a, a compose it. So I'm just trying to check with you as to what kind of training do you give to those teachers who would be able to, in, in, in order to 
to assist them to implement the, 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 the program well when it starts next year. Thank you. Okay, Th thanks. thanks for those questions. The issue of the um, uh, incorporation of the Cypel Cycelt into free service, we haven't formalized it. We've spoken to the universities about it. We've done presentations in the Dean's Forum. And we've had a lot of discussions, and Caroline will share with you. I think one university has taken on the course um, as part of one of its credit, uh, one of its diplomas. But she, she'll share the detail. I'll, I'll just. Oh, you want to? Yeah, yeah. Let me just finish off with that one. Um, in fact, when I say uh, pre-service, I mean um, it's we, we we're not aiming to to teach the students, but it's to involve the universities and the the, the education faculties. So for, for all the initial rounds of training that were organized by the DBE, all the universities were, education faculties were invited and many of them sent representatives. And so far we've had a lot of interest from Northwest University who have actually taken Seifelt and Seifelt and put it through uh, SACE and um, also WITS. Its language school has also shown a lot of interest in it. So essentially, that these courses are available to any university who would may be interested in maybe incorporating a portion of it into a PGCE or a B.Ed. or offer it as a standalone course, like because um, Northwest actually has a big distance learning uh, faculty and they're still doing these certificate courses. They thought it would be really useful. So. It's a resource that's available. And also for the rollout, we see the universities being partners in the rollout to all of these teachers. Okay, your second question. So who are these teachers? Where are they? How good are they? I think that's your question you're asking. And that's the struggle we're having. As I indicated, there's a shortage of teachers. So one of the reasons for the delay was that we found that there's not too many of them. There's a few strong ones. In the case of Western Cape, for example, they use the itinerant teaching method. So one master teacher was roving between schools, but can you imagine the timetable nightmare then? So that's the struggle that we had. And so at the moment, the provinces are, you, look, they, 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 they've gone on a recruitment drive. I don't have the figures on the top of my head, but there was a Council of Education Ministers meeting, two meetings actually. Council of Education Ministers are our provincial ministers of education. And they did the feasibility study and the risk analysis. And the view is that we are ready to run. But one sense, having worked in the field for a long time, is that even though we will have, we, we've done training of all, we trained 200 subject advisors last year and the year before in preparation for this. And as you know, our system then depends on the provincial officials to train the teachers, which has its strengths and weaknesses. So at the moment, the indication is that there's a level of readiness. But as I mentioned in my presentation, we've asked our provinces to do a profile of each of the teachers who are going to be teaching and to then determine their development needs to offer the language properly and make sure that they are supported while they, they start with the implementation. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize. We've had to cut so much short today. We're already over time now, so I think we'll end it there. But I'd like to... Uh, give to each one of the presenters a thank you for your presentation and have a picture of each one of you.